Hello, everybody, and welcome to the channel. In today's archive video, we have esteemed astrologer, author, and lecturer Bruce Schofield discussing symmetry in astrology, looking at declination, Antitia, Arabic parts, and also discussing Uranian astrology with the 360 and 90 degree dial, looking at midpoints and solar arcs. If you are interested in any of today's topics, please see the link below this video in the description for course details. And lastly, we have esteemed astrologer Maurice Fernandez conducting his Eclipses workshop on November 4th tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific time. If you can't attend the live workshop, all our videos are recorded and can be viewed at your leisure. And without further ado, I'm going to grab a cup of tea and enjoy re-watching this lecture. Astrology is a subject that um, and it has its own history and it has its own methodologies. and uh, There are many facets to it, just like any other subject. Um, although at the present time in history, nearly all of the people in astrology are doing practice, right? But we could step back and look at astrology as a subject that basically uh, maps out uh, processes that go on in dynamic systems. Uh, a dynamic system would be like a cell or a person or a, a collective group of people. My definition of astrology is a, uh, a, a set of mapping techniques you know, for um, complex systems. So uh, a, a human being is a complex system with a body and mind and all that. And the horoscope is a map. And there are other, other ways to map or chart out what goes on over time. Uh, uh, in addition to the horoscope, there are graphic techniques and so on. So we should be open to alternatives to the, the standard horoscope, uh, you know, pizza pie diagram. There are different ways of, of looking at these things. And one of them is through symmetry. And if you really step back far enough, you could argue that symmetry is the organizing principle in astrology. Um, and and if you, uh, the next slide from here, I'll begin to you know show uh, why that I believe that is so. But um, what's even more important is that symmetry is an organizing principle of life. Um, now, just due to the fact that in our the world that we live in, we have gravity pulling us down, and you know, and we have to rise above it. Um, this tends to shape organisms as they evolve in certain ways. Um, motion requires certain kinds of forms, and it turns out that nearly all of our body forms and the body forms, you know, of other organisms. Um, are built on some kind of symmetry. Um, and it's usually bilateral. That means that there's, you know, a central axis, you know, think the spine, and, and mirror image appendages radiating out on each side of that spine or axis. And nearly all organisms, certainly, um, you know, it's obvious in plants and animals and whatnot, have a bilateral kind of symmetry. You know, we have two eyes. Uh, there, there's a, a value in, in symmetry. Not only does it um, stabilize the organism as it exists, but it also creates uh, redundancy, where if, like, one part goes, you still got the other one working for you. So it really is, symmetry is a very, in, it's, it's, it's intelligent design. Exactly, that's what it is. Now, there have been other kinds of symmetry. There were organisms that lived, uh, you know, roughly uh, 550 to 520 million years ago uh, called the Ediacaran biota, and some of those had trilateral symmetry. Um, they were kind of an experiment in life that didn't work out very well. Um, but the point here is that Symmetry is a very fundamental organizing principle of life, and, and you see it wherever you look. Now, symmetry is uh, found all over astrology. I mean, the first thing is, is in the sequence of the zodiac. And we all know that we have positive signs or, you know, uh, followed by negative signs. You know, there's a polarity, it's called, you know, so you have... Aries, which is plus, and Taurus, which is minus, and 
Gemini, which is plus, and Cancer, which is minus, and it goes right around the zodiac. Uh, so there's an, uh, an alternation of waves in that sense. There are also uh, alternations if you look in terms of the qualities and the elements and so on, and they're all, all in balance with each other. You, you draw these geometrically and they, they look very harmonious. Um, you can see symmetry in the idea of aspects applying and separating. And in synodic cycles, um, you have uh, orbs, for example, in aspects. Now, so you have an orb of, say, 10 degrees. So it's 10 degrees before a point, 10 degrees after a point. There's a certain symmetry there. Now, some people might argue that not all aspects, you know, have a symmetrical orb. You know, it's probably, it's been my observation that the orb of a Saturn transit is like weighted on the far end, whereas the orb of a Mars transit is weighted on the front end. But for the most part, there's a certain kind of symmetry there. Uh, synodic cycles display a certain amount of symmetry. Take the sun-moon synodic cycle, which we're all familiar with as the new moon, first quarter, full moon, third quarter. Um, there's a, a, a rhythm to that. Um, recurrent cycles, for example, where the new moon occurs over time or where Venus-Sun conjunctions occur over time, if you overlay them, you get uh, you know, these pretty geometrical diagrams because those points are always moving. Uh, there's what's, what's called planetary conjunction drift. Um, Symmetry in astrology could also be thought of in terms of vector geometry, like the directions from the center that the planets are located. And we'll talk about that later in uh, terms of midpoints. And you can think of even secondary progressions as being an example of symmetry in astrology, because the symmetry here is uh, the day to the year. Uh, and in secondary progressions, all the things that go on between the planets in the course of one day are then translated to the course of one year, but in proportion. So there's a certain type of symmetry um, that, that is uh, found there. Now here's your classic symmetrical astrological diagram. And you can see here that we have on the left uh, the triplicities. And so we have Aries over here linked to Leo and Sagittarius. And there's, they form a nice trine here, an uh, equilateral triangle. And the same for the Earth signs and air signs and water signs. And then we also have the, the symmetry of the qualities. Uh, in, in this case, we have Taurus over here, the fixed sign Taurus to the fixed sign Leo fixed sign Scorpio and fixed sign Aquarius forming a, a square. But they're, they're all symmetrical to each other. They're equidistant. You know, this is not some kind of uh, uh, erratic, you know, anomalous collection of uh, linkages between signs. The linkages between the signs and traditional astrology are very precise, and they're all symmetrical. It's, you know, symmetry is embedded in the zodiac itself. Here's another example of symmetry in the zodiac, uh, sometimes called the ladder of the planets, where you have rulerships um, designated by an axis that runs between Cancer and Leo and Capricorn and Aquarius, with Saturn ruling the top two and Moon and Sun ruling the bottom. But then you have Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter uh, ruling signs um, on equal uh, um, adjacent sides of this axis. And there's also a, uh, a kind of a Chaldean order here, too, because we move from Mercury to Venus, Mercury being the f fastest mover, followed by Venus, Mars, and then Jupiter, and Saturn. So there's symmetry built into our definitions of rulership in the zodiac. Uh, it's a neat scheme. There's no question about it. Um, I wonder who invented it or, you know, or discovered it. Uh, but it, it looks very nice, and it does seem to work. I mean, an entire 
uh, field of study in astrology is based on the study of the essential dignities. And uh, there are symmetries in the essential dignities as well because they will involve things like triplicity, which I just pointed out was symmetrical. I'm not sure what to do about the terms. I'm, I don't know uh, what we what to say about the terms other than there's a tendency for them to end with Saturn in the last degrees and so on. But the, uh, the other um, components of essential dignities are for the most part symmetrical. So this is, you know, it, when you talk about s symmetrical astrology, you really have to include these extremely traditional, even ancient ideas in astrology uh, that show how the signs and the planets are all related to each other in uh, you know, a harmonious structure. Now here's an example of symmetry in astrology. It's declination. Now declination is the distance north or south of the celestial equator. Now I'm going to go to the next slide and come back to this one. This is a diagram uh, of the uh, celestial sphere. And this is the Earth in the middle. Now you can't see all the circle there, but it says Earth. And here's the pole, the, you know, the north, this is the south pole coming out of the Earth, and there's the north pole coming out of the Earth. And it's dotted line. You can see north celestial pole. The idea of a celestial sphere is simply a, it's a projection of the, uh, the physical attributes of um, uh, dimensions of the Earth and uh, um, directions and so on that are projected onto the sky. And that's why it's called celestial. And it's uh, a way that we map where planets are located. So here's the ecliptic. This is the path of the planets. Actually, it's, the, it's called the ecliptic because the sun defines it, and it's only on the ecliptic that an eclipse can occur. But for the most part, the planets follow the sun and stay within this plane. It's because the way the solar system was formed. The solar system was formed by a collapsing dust cloud about four and a half billion years ago. And it started uh, spinning. As, and as gravity was pulling the dust cloud towards the center, and it was spinning, and there are various reasons why it started spinning, but let's leave that out for now, um, it flattens out. It's like a skater pulling in their arms when they're doing a spin, and they go faster and faster. So as gravity pulled in the material, it spun faster and faster, and pretty soon spun out the outer material into a flat disk. So the origin of the solar system looked like a giant UF, you know, flying saucer. And then the planets uh, kind of condensed uh, in that dust and the, on the outer parts and the inner part became the sun. So in the end, we have all the planets orbiting along this ecliptic. But the problem is that the Earth is not, is tilted 23 and a half degrees to the ecliptic. And that the tilt of the Earth is what gives us our seasons. So if we project the equator of the Earth out into space, we get the celestial equator. And you can see that going around here. And the celestial equator is at 90 degrees to the poles. Well, anyway, the celestial equator intersects with the ecliptic at only two points, 0 degrees Aries and 0 degrees Libra. And that's the only time they're coincident. Otherwise, they are you know, not on the same line at all. And when you get to the solstices, they're 23 and a half degrees apart. Now, declination, which is a very important component and factor in astrology, is measured against the celestial equator, not the ecliptic. So what we're interested in, if we're looking for a parallel or a contraparallel in declination, we're going to be measuring how far above or below the equator the planet is. Now, let's go back to the other diagram. And this, is, this line here is zero that I have is very close to zero. I guess I'm... I missed a little bit. It's supposed to be right on zero. And here's January, December. I started at December 21st and ended at December 21st. And this is the declination of the sun throughout the year. So at the solstices, it's at um, its maximum. Here it's 23 degrees south, so you have minus 20. And if we get to June, when we have the summer solstice, we're up here at 23 degrees north declination. So over the course of the year, the sun's declination moves like this. And this goes on. It's the same every year. Now, the way we measure declination 
uh, a parallel is in terms of distance north or south of the equator. So if a, one planet is located at minus 10 and another planet is located at plus 10, that's called a contraparallel. If a planet is located, one planet is located at, say, 15, and another planet in a totally different sign is located at 15 degrees, then that's a parallel. But it's measured equal, you know, equally from this one point. Now, this axis, this is, this, the equator is an axis against which we measure things. And in the case of a parallel, it's equidistant. In the case of a contraparallel, it's also equidistant, but one north and one south. Now, this diagram, I'll come back to it uh, in a minute as well, because it illustrates something about uh, a subject in astrology called Antician, Antissia. Antissia is a, uh, an observation and, and methodology in astrology that goes back to the Hellenistic times. It's um, basically the search for equidistant points from the solstice axis. The idea is that every planet has its antician, its counterpoint. So, for example, I have over here three degrees of, tar of Leo. So if you happen to have a planet at three degrees of Leo, its antician is going to be the same, the d same distance from three Leo to zero Cancer, but on the other side. Um, so let's say we start at zero degrees Cancer and we go all the way through the sign Cancer and we've got 30 degrees. And then we add three degrees because we're three degrees into Leo, and we have a total of 33 degrees into, you know, from the um, zero degrees Cancer, which is zero degrees Cancer is the solstice. The antician of that point, three degrees of Leo, is 33 degrees in the other direction. So we've got to go all the way through Gemini, which is 30 degrees, and then we go three degrees into Taurus, and that turns out to be 27 Taurus. So in the ancient doctrine of Antissia, if you have a planet at 3 degrees of Leo, then 27 degrees of Taurus might be an important degree for you. Because any time a planet occupies that degree, it's, it completes a symmetry with the, the axis defined by the solstices. Now, I think I have a, a diagram here, as I do. And this is a chart. Uh, of the zodiac, and you can see that zero degrees Cancer is at the top, and zero degrees Cancer Capricorn is at the bottom. So if we were to look at, that's Cancer, and there's Leo over there. If we were to go three degrees of Cancer, it's roughly where my pointer is right now. So the antithion to that point would be equidistant in the other direction, which would be right over here. And that turns out to be 27 degrees of Taurus. So Antissia is a very traditional methodology for um, finding sensitive points using the Cancer Capricorn axis as the primary axis. Now, what I have here is the, the formula for calculating these. Um, and the first thing you need to do is convert all your degrees uh, of your planets that you want to work with. Um, into absolute longitude. So if you have a planet at 6 degrees of Gemini, it would be 66 degrees. You take the degree of the planet that you want to calculate and add it to these figures here. If you have something at uh, 15 Scorpio, then you'd add 15 to 210, and you would get 225. That's rule number one for calculating uh, an antician. Uh, for the planet's areas through Virgo, you can just use a simple formula, 180 minus the planet is going to give the antician. But it, for planets uh, Libra through Sagittarius, you need to do different things, 270 minus planet plus 270, and 360 minus planet plus 180. Now, that's if you want to do it by hand. You know, some people think mathematically, and this is very easy for them, others, others don't. But if you use a 
a grid like this, a 360 degree grid, which are found on most astrology programs today. They vary. This one is from Astrolabe's uh, chart wheels. It's much easier, and there are markers in here that give you reference points as well. Like suppose you had a, a point right there where this dot is, which is 45 degrees. You automatically know that the Antician is going to be located over here. Um, there are other ways of there are um, contra Antician, which are based on, I suppose you have a planet here at 15 degrees Taurus. The contra Antician would be over here at 15 degrees of Aquarius. And so what happens is that those are relative to the Aries Libra axis. Or you could look at that as equidistant from Cancer and then equidistant from Capricorn. But the idea is, is symmetry. You know, the doctrine of Antisius says that for every point in the zodiac, there's a balanced point. There's a, there's a point that's harmonious with it relative to an axis. So um, in order to have symmetry, you have to have an axis. It's just like the analogy of the spine being the axis and the limbs coming out on the sides, you know, being balanced relative to each other. Bruce, it's something inherent in nature. Yeah, good question. There, there's a request you of the picture that you had of the celestial equator. If you yeah. could show parallel and contra parallel there, and maybe also it'd be good to see the Antitia as it appears from that. Okay, let me see if I can go back. Okay, so using this diagram, we see here that. The, the intersection of the equator, the celestial equator, and the ecliptic is zero Aries, and over here is zero Libra. And here is the solstice. That would be zero Cancer, and this would be zero Capricorn. So if you had a planet, say here, which would probably be in Gemini somewhere, the Antician would be on the other side over there somewhere in Cancer. So it looked like that. But probably even more uh, useful would be to look at um, what I believe is the original basis behind Antissia in the first, uh, to begin with, is um, this graph of the declination of the sun. Now remember I said that the planets, for the most part, stay in the plane of the sun. And the, any planet's declination is going to be dependent on the sign position that it's in. And planetary declinations are only high when the planets are near the solstices. And they're going to tend to be low when they're near the equinoxes, just as the sun's is. So when the sun is at the equinox, the declination is zero. This is the spring equinox in March. And here's the fall equinox in September. And the declinations are high at the solstices north in the summer and south in the winter. So the sun's declination on, this looks like early May, is going to be about 16 degrees north. But also in early August, it's going to be at 16 degrees north because the sun is moving back down in declination. And so there's, this would be, the, this, this would create a uh, symmetrical relationship to the summer solstice equal, um, you know, axis. And so if a planet was, uh, if the sun is here, if you were born, in, say, May 3rd, the antician to your sun is going to be over here somewhere in Leo, you know, probably about 10 degrees of Leo or, or, or so on. And the other planets are going to be very similar. Just look in the ephemeris. You'll see that if you have, if you have Venus in Cancer, its declination is going to be high. If you have Venus in Aries, its declination is going to be low. They all follow that pattern. So you, you, I'm suggesting that you think of Antissia as being a observation and technique in astrology that probably is founded on the, the declination of the sun throughout the year, the declination cycle. And that relates ultimately to length of day, and it relates to, relates to rising position on the horizon. But I'm not going to go there today because that's a more complex topic. So That's ba question. based on that, then how do you use your interpretation of the Antisha? 
Well, that's a good question. I, I think that you want to look at it this way, that the Cancer Capricorn axis is something that's, you know, represents the world. You know, it's 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 something that's in common that has that has commonality with the whole globe. So if you were born with say the sun at you know, using that same example, three degrees of Leo, the point at twenty seven degrees of Taurus is gonna represent a point that's gonna bring you in touch with the world. So suppose you meet somebody who has Jupiter at 27 degrees of Taurus. They may be the vehicle or, or the, you know, the initiator through which you experience a, uh, say, a rise in status or, you know, your, your progress in life is accelerated in some ways. So in other words, it, the Antician, the, first of all, you got to consider what the planet means that you're looking at. I mean, if it's your Mercury, then if you have Mercury at three degrees of Leo, and using this example again, and you meet somebody that has Saturn at 27 degrees of, of uh, Taurus, they might hinder your thinking in, in the world. You know, may, suppose you have a teacher, you go to a college class, and you get a teacher that has Saturn 27 degrees of Taurus. You might have a really hard time learning from them and advancing. On the other hand, if, if you're you're going into some kind of a program that just requires uh, repetition and you know structure, then maybe it'll work. You know, maybe that would be good for a math class. You have to take it. You have to take them all on their own terms. So, in your own chart, when you have a parallel, you're essentially mirroring that. So it works. Well, it could be. You know, you can have two parallels but the, uh, a parallel of planets that are just near each other in the zodiac. Okay. They don't have the same declination. But if it turns out that the two planets are opposite sides of the Cancer Capricorn axis, then they could not only be in parallel, but also be in Antician. So, it, it, you know, the, we have a little orb room here, a little wiggle room. You know, it, uh, but the idea behind it is... Uh, is pretty straightforward. It's a symmetrical point relative to the Cancer Capricorn axis. Now, a lot of people don't use these points because uh, it's hard to see how they work. And my examples that I gave, uh, you know, suggest that it's it'll maybe a little more subtle. Um, you know, I think that when you do astrology, it's very easy to stick with simple personality characteristics. But when you start trying to interpret something, on a larger scale, it's a little difficult because a lot of it depends on the society that the person lives in and you know what the values are of the time. Uh, astrology stays the same in principle, but it has to vary according to uh, what historical period we're living in. Uh, I think essential dignities, for example, were extremely relevant to a, a more um, stratified society. And not that today's society isn't stratified. It is in a different way, monetarily, but um, it's not quite as, as uh, uh, demanding as it might have been back then. Anyway, you know, regardless, I, I think that the, the interpretation of Anticia is probably best thought of in terms of how a person actually functions in the outside world. And planets at the Antician of your natal planets are, may offer some insights into how you're uh, helped or hindered. And you could look at transiting points to the uh, Anticians and get insights. And you can also look at the points that are in the charts of people that you relate to. And of course, progressions and solar arcs, any, any kind of moving point that's going through uh, an Antician in your chart, you'll probably notice it. Okay, there's a, there's a couple last little questions on this. One okay. is that it sounds like the antician has has the nature of a conjunction. So is that similar to saying the parallel has a nature of a conjunction? Yeah, I think that what we're talking about with anticia and with declinations are um, blendings, like a, a, a kind of pure blending of the two planets, the two principles. And we would tend to see that 
most obviously in terms of a conjunction, which is the, the most pure blending that you get. You know, the, you get squares between planets, and they kind of often fight each other. The conjunction really is, you know, two colors put in a pot and stirred. <laughs> and the other question is just looking at this, it looks like it is also very much related to the Thema Mundi where you have the Cancer Capricorn axis as your starting point, your 1-7 where we put Aries Libra. Have you, you mean this, this, um, this diagram here? Yeah. Well, I mean, when you were talking about calculating it, I was thinking, well, you know, we have to go through quite, and this other person was probably thinking the same thing, where we have to go through quite a bit to translate it by starting everything from Aries. But what if, if we start everything, if we're using Antitia and start it all from Cancer, which is the starting point in the Thema Mundi. So it seems like it's all part of that same, I don't know if you've looked at that or not. No, I just, you know, I learned astrology in the traditional way where we count from zero Aries mm -hmm. all around the zodiac, and I got used to thinking in terms of absolute longitude. And then I used these dials, and I never thought anything else about it other than just like looking for symmetry around an axis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now here's another example of symmetry in astrology, Arabic parts or Hellenistic lots, the, the original ones. Everybody knows at least one Hellenistic lot or Arabic part, and that's the part of fortune. And Arabic parts are basically a way of uh, finding a, a uh, hy you know, an invisible planet location transposition relative to the ascendant. There are many variations, of course. But what people usually don't think about or realize is that the calculation of a point actually involves calculation around an axis that, you know, uh, the, the point that's calculated completes symmetry around an axis. And it's in the case of many of the traditional Arabic parts, it's the midpoint of the sun and ascendant is the axis. And you could see Arabic parts as in terms of equal arcs. So the arc between the sun and any planet is equal to the arc between the ascendant and that planet's part. So when you're thinking of Hellenistic lots and Arabic parts, you're, you're really thinking about a kind of symmetry involving distance relative to the ascendant axis. And if the, of course, this is all measured on the ecliptic, not the equator in the case of, as, as the case is in uh, declinations. So here's an example of um, Barack Obama's chart. And we see that he's a night birth and you know you calculate his part of fortune accordingly and here it is at 27 degrees Aries in 15 minutes. And you know it, we we treat it as a point. We don't really, you know, think too much about it. It's just a point and there are delineations for it and so on seems to have a lot to do with the health of the body. And it does involve the sun, moon, and ascendant in the calculations. But what's going on behind the scenes is shown in this diagram here. This is a, a 360 degree zodiac. And this is zero degrees over here. So that would be Aries, right? And this is 30 degrees. And that would be Taurus, 60 degrees, Gemini, and so on, all the way through the zodiac. And Barack Obama's positions, so his natal positions, are placed on this grid. Like we know, if we go back, we see that his moon is at 3 degrees of Gemini and his sun is at 12 degrees of Leo. So over here, here's his moon. At 60 is the beginning of Gemini, and we go 3, and lo and behold, there's the moon. And here's the 120 is where Leo begins, and we go 12 degrees out, and there's the sun. So here's how this part of fortune is really calculated. We take the midpoint between the sun and the ascendant. Remember, this ascendant is over here in Aquarius. 
And then we have an axis to that midpoint. Any midpoint has an axis. axis. You can take any two points, like you, know, you could take, say, the Moon and Venus over here, right? And somewhere right in the middle, you can calculate it out, there's the midpoint. And then you can draw an axis all the way through the middle over here to the other side of the zodiac. So what's done with the Arabic parts is you've got the sun ascendant. You take the midpoint, you draw an axis, and one side of the axis is the moon. And then equidistant from the axis is the part of fortune. So and this is set up for a, a night birth, of course, but you would do the similar thing with the um, day birth, but uh, moon and ascendant. But the point here is that you have an axis around which is grouped moon, part of fortune, sun, ascendant. And we can go back to that other diagram. We can see that if you take the um, part of fortune, the moon, and the midpoint in here, which turns out to be about 18 degrees of Taurus, and then we run that across to the other side over here, 18 degrees of Scorpio, and if you were to measure it, it would be the same distance for, to the sun as to the ascendant. So the real deal here is an 18 degree Taurus Scorpio axis. And it will be very interesting to see what goes on when Saturn crosses that axis, which will happen in just a few months. And the president is, you know, exhibit one for astrology. Um, I've worked with his chart enough times to know that it works. So I have to conclude he was born in Hawaii when he said he was. He's in the public eye, and we can we can follow him very clearly. And we should we should watch when Saturn gets to that point, roughly 18 degrees of the of Scorpio. So we can see that the doctrine of Hellenistic lots and Arabic parts is in reality a kind of symmetrical astrology, except it's never expressed that way. It's expressed as a formula, and the formulas uh, you know vary, and uh, you can see lists of parts. Uh, there must be hundreds of parts. Um, if you go on uh, astrology programs and look up Arabic parts or parts or whatever they, whatever they happen to be called, um, you'll see a long list. Do they all work? I don't know. I, I think there may be something to a lot of it because we're, we're dealing with symmetry. And so when a planet comes by and occupies the degree, 27 degrees Aries, that the part of fortune is, it actually kind of completes this, what's called a planetary picture, where you have, you know, moon, and then the, whatever point is completing it, and then you have sun ascended. And also in the case of Barack Obama, this axis is very hot. It's also the midpoint of his Uranus and Jupiter and uh, Saturn and Pluto. Actually, it's, I'm sorry, it's uh, Uran uh, Jupiter and Node. So it's Jupiter, Node, and Pluto, Saturn are all in that axis. So that's, that's, this is a symmetrical chart. Now, one of the things that um, I like to uh, point out is that there's a preference for symmetry in nature. And the classic example, I mean, the classic examples are all around us. You know, organisms, most people, you know, just think about animals, but there's a lot more than animals out there. Animals are only a very small part of the tree of life. But let's talk about animals. And uh, animals that are physically well-proportioned are the ones that are usually more successful in mating and consequently spread their genetic material over a wider area, or, and there, or there's more of it, more, more of their offspring. Uh, this has been demonstrated with bird calls. The birds that get the, get the notes just right are the ones that the females will mate with. And it's been shown with human beings that babies respond to the most symmetrical faces and men and women are attracted to those of the opposite sex with the most symmetrical faces. Uh, this, is, this is fact. This is, you know, as much as a fact as you can get when you do study after study and it turns out to be that way. What I'm pointing to is that when you look at charts this way, with the planets drawn up this way, and there are other various mapping techniques that can reveal symmetry, a lot of symmetry, you know, propels the person into a different level than might be ordinarily the case. 
So, you know, this would be exhibit one over here. Barack Obama happens to have a very hot uh, axis that involves not only this part of fortune, but, you know, Jupiter and Node and Saturn and Pluto. Um, he's got a lot of symmetry. And he has floated to the top, or however else he got there. Networked his way to the top. I mean, think about it. Jupiter node, if you blend Jupiter and node in a pot, what you're going to get are, you know, helpful connections. It's Saturn and Pluto, that's high power. You know, uh, presumably, and it's, you know, he's playing very high, you know, complex power games with uh, everyone in the, you know, the leaders of the world and corporate leaders and so on. And that's how it blends in and into his chart. And it's sun ascendant axis. Uh, the sun and ascendant is his physical power, his vitality, and his ascendant, the presentation of self in everyday life. You know, they're both very vital. Okay, let's turn to Uranian astrology, which is also called the Hamburg School. And it was this... Uh, tradition in astrology that started in the early 20th century and largely centered around, centered around uh, a man named Alfred Vita. And he had, um, I'll show his chart in a minute. Uh, he, you know, he not almost single-handedly put it together, but other people contributed as well. He was a, um, an astrology student of people that were uh, learning from the English astrologers, Alan, Leo, and Safariel, and so on. But in Germany, they had access to different kinds of translations. Uh, for example, Kepler. Um, and a number of ancient astrologers as well. And Vita did spend some time thinking about these things. Uh, if anyone ha reads Kepler, in a, uh, you'll realize that he has a very different take on astrology. He sees it as a kind of resonance, and you know he does. He does. He's not into the zodiac. He, he likes the aspects between the planets, the the arc openings, and so on. And Vita developed a way of looking at astrology and dealing with it that is intensely symmetrical. And he developed these dials, these different ways of displaying. The information. This one we've already seen. It's called a 360 degree dial because it shows the whole zodiac. And this one is a 90 degree dial, which is basically the zodiac folded four times on itself. This whole 30 degree section here are all the cardinal signs. And this one is all the fixed, and this one is all the mutable. But what's interesting about Vita and his, and his um, collaborators they came up with a kind of astrology that's just as unique as, or nearly as unique as, uh, say, Chinese astrology or Vedic astrology. It's, a comp it's, it's its own brand. It's very different. It doesn't even look like regular astrology, except when you look at this glyphs for the zodiac and the planets. The whole approach is different. Now, one of the things points I like to make is that we have a case here of pretty much a single individual, with, with help from a few other people, putting together a whole methodology, a whole way of doing astrology, that it's quite possible that a single individual or maybe a few individuals could have put together astrology as it came to be known during the Hellenistic period. You know, so sometimes progress in fields really depends on just a few people or, or even one person. Now, this is Alfred Vita. He was a surveyor, and he worked uh, during World War II in the service, and he started, he was observing, you know, artillery barrages and mapping them out with the rotation of the earth and uh, developing his techniques all during World War I. In the process, he managed to discover some, hy some planets which have yet to be discovered, if they, if they actually exist, hypothetical planets. And that is a part of the Uranian system, but it's not, it's just an add-on. You don't need these hypothetical planets to do Uranian astrology. But you can see that he has a very close conjunction of Mercury, Venus, and Moon 
at uh, between 27 and 28 degrees of Aquarius, and it's opposite, very closely Uranus. So this tells us right away that this is not your ordinary mind. He was also born within a, a week or two of Einstein, Albert Einstein. Uh, so he was quite a person, but he was a Pisces, and he never really wanted to be a leader. A group formed, uh, they were called the Hamburg School, and developed the ideas, and uh, some of it spread to the United States, uh, largely in New York. Individual in particular, Hans Nigemann, uh, was promoting it in New York during the 50s and 60s, and maybe even into the 70s. And I was one of the people that was interested in it at the time, and I met him a few times. And uh, so he was kind of a carrier from that, you know, first wave of Uranian astrology and uh, propagated the material on mimeographed, you know, homemade books that he sold for outrageous amounts of money. But one of the techniques that Uranian astrology utilizes are midpoints. Now, let me back up a minute and say that Uranian astrology spawned many ideas that have made their way into mainstream astrology. And one of them is midpoints. People do know about these things, and some people use them you know, uh, regularly. But other ideas have come from the Uranian system, one, another being solar arc, another being the composite chart. Now, it's not that Alfred Vitta invented everything. He did invent quite a few things, but he put together a lot of ideas that were pretty much going nowhere in astrology and uh, made them into a system. And the system has then has influenced other astrologers. Reinhold Ebertin was another German who built on uh, Vitta's work without really aligning himself with Vitta and promoted a kind of astrology called cosmobiology. He also used the dials. He didn't use the hypothetical planets. He emphasized just midpoints. Now, midpoint is simply a point equidistant from two other points, and it's almost always measured on the ecliptic. If you, if you measure it on the equator, as we saw before, a contraparallel, um, you know, it could be, you could, you could, you could say that the, the equator is the midpoint of two planets in contraparallel, but let's move over to the ecliptic and stay there. So midpoints can be found between any points on the chart, just as I showed you in that 360-degree chart of Barack Obama. One way to think about this is that these traditional aspect patterns, like a T-square, are really midpoint patterns. So suppose you have a midpoint, uh, it's T-square rather, and you have a planet at 15 Aries and one at 15 Libra and one at 15 Capricorn. Well, the planet at 15 Capricorn is at the midpoint of the, the Aries planet and the Libra planet. Uh, suppose you have a grand trine. You've got a planet at 10 Pisces and 10 Cancer and 10 Scorpio. So the planet at 10 Pisces is at the midpoint of the planet at planets at 10 Scorpio and 10 Cancer. The planet at 10 Cancer is at the midpoint of the planets at 10 Scorpio and 10 Pisces. And likewise, the planet at 10 Scorpio is at the midpoint of 10 Pisces and 10 Cancer. So you can look at a grand trine as being a giant midpoint pattern. And that's why some grand trines work pretty well and some don't. Suppose you have Sun, Trine, Uranus, Trine, Mars, the grand trine of those three. Well, the Sun's at the midpoint of Mars and Uranus. And, it, you know, and then the person has an accident, and you wonder why. Oh, the grand trine's supposed to be uh, you know, favorable. No, the Sun's at the midpoint of Mars-Uranus. It's pulling in the energy of, of uh, Uranus and Mars equally, and those thing, things mix in a volatile way, usually. You can be constructive with all these things. I mean, Mars-Uranus could mean that you like to hit things with, with tools, you know, work with tools, build things, or maybe blow up things. And you, some people get paid to do that. It's not that any combination is good or bad. It's just the, you know, the proper application is necessary in the case of some of these you know, difficult ones. Uh, a yod is a really good example of a midpoint pattern because you have two planets in sextile, 
And another one is at the what would be called the far midpoint. It's on the other side of the zodiac. But between two planets in sextile, there is a midpoint, and that's the the axis that you know axis of the yacht. Two planets in sextile, and a third one on the opposite side of the zodiac that's equidistant from both. An example would be you have a planet at uh, 15 degrees of Aries, and then that would be your say. Let's call that the the focal point. And then you have a planet at 15 degrees of Virgo and 15 degrees of Scorpio. So if you take 15 Virgo and 15 Scorpio, the midpoint is 15 Libra. And the Libra axis, if you take that axis and run it out to 15 degrees Aries, there you go. So um, a yacht is a midpoint configuration. The midpoints are usually written as follows. You have, okay, Saturn equals Sun slash Moon. This is another way of writing a midpoint, sun plus moon minus Saturn equals Saturn. And it's the way that was traditionally, is traditionally used in um, uh, Uranian astrology. You get the same result if you plug the numbers in and you use absolute longitude, you know, as I was using before, and you add these up, you'll see that there's, a, there's an equation here, the formula, and it focuses on Saturn as the midpoint of sun and moon. Now this is all a case of how you want to think about it. And some people think about it very easily this way. They like the numbers. Uh, other people don't. Other people just like to see a simple relationship like this. This would be, this looks more like a Arabic point. And I think the idea of Arabic points was something that Alfred Vita took very seriously and incorporated into his uh, brand of astrology. And he used uh, the, the formula, the formula of the Hellenistic lots and Arabic parts to describe the various structures that he would observe in a chart. And he, he liked the mathematical precision of it, and so this is how you would do it. You know, you can't really use numbers when you express the midpoint this way, but you can here. What Vita was really interested in was the idea of planetary pictures. If you have a midpoint, if you have you know two planets and there's another planet at the midpoint of those, that's a planetary picture. But planet, planetary pictures are more like the one I was showing in the example of Barack Obama. You have uh, a number of things grouped together around an axis. So uh, a planetary picture is a grouping of planets around an axis. And this is really the, the true core of Uranian astrology, and that's why it's today called, you know, symmetrical astrology, because it is. If you if you if you if the subject is defined by symmetry around an axis, it's all symmetrical astrology. Now, notice we haven't really talked about sign positions much. In Uranian astrology, signs are taken into account, but they're not dominant. The most important thing in Uranian astrology is the symmetry between points around an axis. And it's through those kinds of structures, which Vita called planetary pictures, that meaning is derived from the chart. What we want to do in astrology is derive meaning from astronomical data calculated for some kind of critical point, some kind of threshold point like birth, like separation from the mothership, transition from water breathing to air breathing launching a ship for the first time or opening a business for the first time or signing some documents. And, you know, these are threshold crossings. Data can be gotten from various, uh, from these, these kinds of moments through traditional astrology, but they can also be obtained through Uranian astrology. And in some cases, Uranian astrology is superior. In some cases, it may not be. They're, they, you know, you want to see different kinds of astrology as potentially complementary rather than, you know, competitive. Now, one of the, the big doctrines in Uranian astrology is that nothing really can, can really happen without the personal points being involved. And the personal points are divided into two categories, personal and collective. So the personal points are sun, mid-heaven, and moon. Now, the sun 
you can understand that. The sun is the, the engine, it's the vitality. It symbolizes vitality that's running the system and consequently the force and power. The midheaven is the point on the ecliptic that's highest up in the sky at the time of, of uh, the event or the birth. And it symbolizes in a person the most pure sense of self in the chart. So Vita would say that the midheaven symbolizes the I am principle. William James, a psychologist, has a section in one of his books where he talks about you know, um, consciousness. And he's sitting there trying to find a sense of himself in a succession of thoughts that go through his head. If any of you meditate and you're, you're in, in, in med, you know, meditation position, you're trying to shut down the mind. If you, any of you have a mind like mine, there's all sorts of noise going on all the time, and it takes a while to really calm it down. But somewhere in there, there's a sense of, of self, a sense of who you are, that, you, that there is some central integrating principle. And Vita would say that that's the midheaven. Some people might say, well, that's the ego. I think if, you can, if the sun is conjunct the, the midheaven, maybe you've got a good definition of ego right there. But they are probably two separate things. The moon is a, uh, a point of emotional and reactive volatility. It, it is a sensitive point, and it's, it's the point that, def, that protects the self. It, it's the adjustment point, the point that seeks uh, accommodation with the environment. So these are all very personal. You know, you have to have energy to live. You have to have a sense of who you are to stay focused. And you have to have some kind of, you know, way of maneuvering yourself in the environment and adjusting to it. And that would be the moon. Now, the collective personal points are the, the Aries point, zero degrees Aries, the ascendant, and the moon's node. Now, Aries is very general. It's the point where the ecliptic and the equator meet. So it's a point of, that's common to the whole world. And it is true that people who are very involved in the world on a, on a high scale, politicians and actors and famous people in general, they will have a lot of emphasis uh, in their chart on zero degrees Aries or also the other cardinal points, zero, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn. So you, you can't, you, can see the Aries point as a link to the outside world. So it's collective. It's not just you. It's you and the rest of the world. The ascendant is a point that I think is really best defined, this is how I define it, as the contact boundary between the self and the not self. And the ascendant is something that kicks in only when you're around other people. If you're minding your own business, sitting in a chair in a room, reading a book or whatever, you're not doing, your ascendant is inactive. It's in sleep mode. But as soon as somebody walks in, your ascendant kicks in, and then you, you negotiate that encounter. So the ascendant is, is very much about the collective. It's about the, the social world around you. And we develop our ascendants based on largely our, our early family experiences and, and birth order and so on. We develop a style and then we use it for the rest of our life. The moon's node has to do with linkages and connections on a slightly larger scale. The node is basically point of networking. So in Uranian astrology, for anything to be of significance, there has to be some connections to these six points or one of these six, or two of them, or the more the, the more the better. You remember in that diagram with Barack Obama, there was an axis that involved sun and ascendant, which is the axis of the part of fortune, but it also brought in some other planetary midpoints as well. We're going to turn to a few examples, and then I'll open up, open up for questions here. But this is Barack Obama's chart on a 360-degree dial. And this is, again, this is from Astrolabe's Chart Wheels you know, program, which is an excellent program for doing this kind of astrology. It's extremely sophisticated. I haven't figured it out yet, or very much of it. It, it, it has a lot of depth. But you can set it up this way, and the, the, the standard format in Uranian astrology is to set up 
a 360 degree dial with Libra where we would usually see Aries. There's some reasons for this based on seasons and so on, but I won't, won't go into them now. Let's just say that this is the convention. So we look at this and we can see there might be some symmetries just around this zero degrees Cancer axis. We go down here and we see here, here's this midheaven. Now notice this midheaven is over here in late Scorpio. We come over here and here's Jupiter in early Aquarius. So what we've got is Jupiter is at the antician of his midheaven. That sounds good. And we have, it looks like he's got Venus very close to zero cancer. So we know that he's got a Venus, a social connection to the world at large right there. Now, this, this dial is designed so you can see the squares very easily, right? They're so easy to see. And we can see this semi-squares and sesquiquadrates with these dots over here. So the square is the fourth harmonic of the zodiac. So if you divide 4 into 360, you get 90. And so the square is not the 90 degree angle here is the fourth harmonic. If you divide 8 into 360, you get 45. And here are the 45 degree points, right? So if you go from here to here, it's 45. And from here to here, it's 45 and so on. So there are eight of them around the zodiac. If you divide further by 16 into 360, you get 22 and a half degrees. And you can see that there are actually markers for the 22 and a half degree aspect. And you can see that, he, that Barack Obama has Pluto on one of those points. We could say just from this diagram that Barack Obama has uh, some link to the world, some strong links. I mean, the Venus up here is one very good one, but I mean, Midheaven and Jupiter centered on that axis and then Pluto tying into it. So there, there are a few things here that suggest that he's well connected to the world, the Aries axis, called Aries just as a symbol, but we're really talking about zero cardinal. It involves the Midheaven and Jupiter over there. So there's a pers there are personal, at least this one personal point is involved in it, a link between the personal point, the Aries axis, Aries solstice axis, and in this case, Jupiter. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm going to look at his, his chart in terms of the sun midheaven midpoint. So I moved the pointer over to the midpoint between the sun and, and the midheaven. You can see it here. See, here, here are the 45 degree points relative to the pointer. And then if you go a certain distance on each side of them, you come to the sun and the midheaven. So we're looking for this, a, a point that creates symmetry between sun and midheaven, and this is it. And it looks like it's at about five or six degrees of Libra in the zodiac. So this is an axis in his chart. It's located right about there. So the next chart, what I've done is, yeah, okay, so I took this axis. And uh, let me just back up and say what I'm, what I'm about to do is demonstrate how the previous election could have, you know, was predicted. You know, I thought Obama would win. A lot of people did. You know, and people use different techniques in astrology to do so, but this was kind of how I did it. So I find the midpoint between midheaven and sun. So this is, the sun is leadership, and the midheaven is the sense of, sense of I, this, the inner person. And then what I did was I added the solar arc to that point. His solar arc was about 49 degrees or so. So if we're at 6 Libra here, I didn't write that in. Sorry about that. So this would be November 2012, midpoint between its midheaven and sun plus the solar arc. And so it would move it up here to this point at this time in its life, which turns out to be the midpoint between Mars and Jupiter. And it's also kind of tied over here to Uranus and Node. But Mars-Jupiter is a winning position, a winning configuration. When I used to do astrology and pick racehorse winners at the track, if Mars and Jupiter, I thought, were you know, good indications that a certain horse would win if the jockey's chart tied into it. I had a system based on the Sun, Mars, Jupiter positions of the jockeys, because you couldn't get their birth times. And I would see where they were in terms of rising and setting. But Jupiter and Mars is a successful campaign, in a sense.
successful war. Now if we go to Mitt Romney, and we have his chart set up here, same way, we can see uh, various combinations. We could you know, attempt to see where midpoints are in the same ways with Barack Obama. I don't think there's uh, quite as much on the cardinal axis. There are some things, but they're not quite as exact. But if we do the same thing, we take, okay, his solar arc at the time, I have it listed here, 64 degrees. And we go to his sun, okay, we start here. We go to his sun midheaven midpoint, which is right here. There's sun, here's midheaven, and this is the midpoint. This is an axis. And it turns out this is a pretty strong midpoint in his chart because it also involves Uranus and Chiron. So it's got that going on. And it also ties into his moon and Jupiter, and even his ascendant over here. I mean, it's, it's pretty close to the midpoint of his moon-Jupiter ascendant contact. So Mitt Romney's, you know, he's been a, a prominent politician. He was the governor of uh, my state of Massachusetts. That's unusual. You know, Massachusetts is primarily a, a blue state, but he got elected. I would think that the moon-Jupiter, I mean, it's a sign of popularity. But if we add the solar arc to that point, now let's go back. This, we're adding 64 degrees to this point here. And we're moving it ahead to over here. Now we've got a new axis. And look what's on the axis. Saturn. So the movement of his midheaven sun midpoint by solar arc ties into Saturn at the time of the 2012 election, and he lost. If it had tied into this moon Jupiter, he probably would have won. Now, I use this technique. It's a little abstract. I mean, I'm, you know, what, what I'm doing is I'm finding a midpoint between important points in the chart, personal points, sun and midheaven, and I'm moving them in the zodiac at the rate of the solar arc. And for those of you who don't know, the solar arc is basically the rate of uh, the same as the progressed sun. If you take your progressed sun and you subtract it from your natal sun at any given age, you get an arc. And what I did was I calculated for early November of 2012, figured out what the arc was. Actually, the computer did that and, and added it on and got those results. So in the case of Barack Obama, it comes out to Mars-Jupiter. In the case of Mitt Romney, it comes out to Saturn. It ties into Saturn. So we see he won and lost. So that's just an example of the kind of things that can be done using this system. It's, it's not the easiest. You've got to be creative. It's just like any other kind of astrology. You just can't go by the book. You, you, know, you have to get used to dealing with a lot of information. You have to know what to weed out, uh, you know, what to, what's important. But you can do amazing things with it. it. It's a system that works very well for electional astrology. It works very well for analyzing events. And it works very well for understanding how a person functions in the world and how they where they go and what they do. I think that it has as much psychological depth as traditional astrology, although most people that practice Uranian astrology tend to be technical in orientation, and they're more interested in techniques. But sooner or later, somebody with great psychological insight is going to write something on Uranian astrology, and it's going to be uh, uh, shown to be as valid a psychological system as any other kind of astrology. So that's my example, and this is the course, this is the commercial portion of the program here, via E510 Kepler College, um, and this is what I cover. I go through coordinate systems for a whole week, um, and there are homework assignments for every week and discussions and so on. There's a, a one hour or so lecture every week that I give. And we talk about declination and latitude, Anticia, Arabic parts, Uranian astrology, midpoints, midpoint trees. 9 degree dials, solar arcs, and the trans-Neptunian planets, and uh, the composite chart. So it's a 10-week course and covers all that. OK, I'm uh, open to questions. There's what, an observation on Romney's chart. Someone was noticing that you have Neptune on a sensitive point as well as Uranus in that chart, and wondering if you'd comment. All right, let me see if I can get back to it. Here we go. Where, which one? Of, which yeah, one of on, on the solar arc one. The solar arc one. Because you see um, the, the Uranus well, is Neptune, on one yeah, of the... Yeah, two and a half. Yeah, yeah and then Neptune, the Uranus on a 45. 
so the, those that aren't, aren't the main ones, do they seem to have as much effect or how do they, how are oh, they, they interpreted? Oh, they definitely feed into it. There's no question they're feeding into it. You know, it's, I, I think that, see, I would read this, the, the Saturn is the most uh, prominent and it is, it's a planet of, of being blocked. You know, you're blocked. Uranus is maybe the shocking quality of it and Neptune is the confusion now. Turns out that he thought he was going to win. He really thought he was going to win. That the uh, you know Fox News, there was that whole Carl Rove thing that was going on, and uh, they were their their people on the ground, poll takers, were completely off. You know there was a, a, a mix of unreality into the, the picture, and there was, so there was a surprise. He had fireworks ready to go off over, uh, you know, in Boston, but it didn't happen. So you know it was a shock. It was, you could read this as a shocking and confusion, confusing blockage and in the matter. Where these things you know, occur exactly, you could calculate these out. And they might be a few months apart in terms of actual you know, position mathematically. But because you have the election at such a big event, it's, you know, it's what you might call a strange attractor. It draws in the aspects within a, within a few months of it. I don't know exactly where these things occur, but they're, they're undoubtedly, you know, within a few months of, of that point. But if you were looking at just a, a scanning a list of things and you were looking for what was going on right at the election, you might not catch it. You'd say, well, the, uh, the Saturn thing is, uh, you know, so actually I think I did figure it out. The Saturn thing was three weeks later or something like that. I, don't, I, I should dig it out. But it wasn't right on the election, but it was close enough. But yes, the, in response to the question, certainly the Uranus and the Neptune is part of it. It's, it's a surprising and confusing ending. One thing, uh, it's an observation about symmetry, noting that it is dualistic, wondering, may indicate a Mercury effect. Perhaps a personal karmic indication is released when current planets activate symmetrical access points. If one has to checkmate before moving forward by a second influence, something that one can refer to when new yet similar symmetries exist or on the horizon. So they're seeing this as, as rather balance, a type of balance. I'm not sure if I've thought about it that way. The way I think about it is that we just have these various sensitive points in the zodiac and that, you know, we're with Uranian astrology, we're discovering them, the, the, the most significant ones trying to better understand them and analyze uh, events and calculate things ahead of time and maybe elect events at those times. Um, maybe I don't understand the question. I think it wasn't so much a question as an observation from fitting into how they're also, you know, their own look at the chart from traditional astrology from a, a soul perspective as well, thinking of it as, as a the challenge for the soul is their, the soul's path. Yeah, where's the soul? <laughs> oh, that opens a whole lot of things as to locating the soul on a chart. Um, yeah. One of, the, yeah, another comment was one of those beauties of this dial is you can really see the visuals so well. And you've yeah. talked about there being different types of dials. Do you have any examples of any of the other? I have a 90 back there. One, one other thing regarding to the last question. Mm -hmm. I think what the, the, the um, question involved or the comment involved in using the word soul was really looking at it as in a kind of a teleological sense that there's, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, stuff to be learned. And that's true. I mean, I think that the beauty in astrology is that it presents us with a, a language that allows us to get deeper insights into the qualities of the of time as we pass through them the quality of time you know, like we're, we're we travel in an, in a physical environment and we travel in a temporal environment and uranian astrology does provide us with additional information from the from the standard chart uh, in regard to the, the nature of of the of time as we move through it and we can be very creative with that you know, we, we could be, we could ignore it and, you know, to our own peril, but we can be very creative with it and build and structure things on. So my, my point of view 
it's it's not necessarily uh, evolutionary in this in the sense that it's used in that branch of astrology called uh, evolutionary astrology. I look at it in just terms of an environment that we're passing through, and that if we're aware, we can utilize our you know uh, our knowledge of the quality of that time and design our lives accordingly. So I tend to think in terms of constant adaptation to the temporal environment rather than some kind of steadily upward path towards return to the Godhead. So so I guess you you could say that I'm I'm more pragmatic in that sense, but I also see it as a very uh, hopeful and creative way of viewing life. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think it sounds good. You know that that's you know I I don't know where the soul is in the, in the in the zodiac in the astrology uh, horoscope, and I'm not even sure what the soul is meant by it. I remember I used to teach that course at Kepler, mm -hmm. and I had right. a that with with the Georgian, I had a whole class on what is the soul, and and I I took, you know, about twenty different definitions of people, and we would you know we would discuss them in the class. You know what what did it mean, and it, and could you find it on the on the chart? And it's hard to say what that is. I think that your Uranian astrology might point to the midheaven as you know being maybe the most personal of the points, and and maybe that would be. Uh, somebody would be comfortable calling that the soul. It's a it's a it's hard enough to delineate the meanings of astrological systems in terms of things that we really know and can touch. It gets extremely difficult when you're dealing with abstractions. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, we do have a um oh here's a practical question. And two of them actually. One is on orbs, you've mentioned a couple of times on it's close enough. What do you consider close enough? Uh, usually about a degree or so, sometimes a little more. If you're, having, if you're dealing with the personal points like midheaven and sun and moon, things like that, you can have an orb of like maybe up to three degrees or so for, for natal work. For events, you want to deal with under a degree. Okay. And I think that you, the, the question before uh, uh, was, let me see if I can go back here, to um, other diagrams from uh, Uranian astrology. And yeah, here we go. This this 90 degree wheel is another tool that's used. I think that's what you're referring to, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it just occurred to me that the, uh, the graphic ephemerities that are found on most astrology software today are also a byproduct of Uranian astrology. It's a, another thing besides composite chart and solar arc and midpoints that have come out of this out of this tradition and have entered the mainstream. Okay, anything else? The other question was what you think is the most practical use for this approach? Well, I like to use it for elections. I like to use it for rectification. I don't think there's anything better than this in, uh, for rectification because you can you can time things very well. I think you can do natal work. I mean, people that are good at this can you know uh, can just read a chart that way. I mean, if I had to, I, I tend to use both methods. Um, I've got a couple planets in Gemini and opposite Jupiter and Sagittarius, so I you know I, to me everything is a stew. So I I tend to look at natal charts in traditional format, pull what I can out of them. In some cases, I find that when I go to the Uranian system, I get additional information. There's some charts that work better in one format than the other, but I jump back and forth, and I, I can use Uranian ideas for anything that I want to get at, really. Timing is timing is very good, a very good use, though. Uh, things like solar arc and you know progressions and whatnot, passing over various axes. Have I'll you ever used it for, for weather predictions? Not really, because I, I, the kind of weather that I'm interested in in testing is just basic uh, planetary cycles. Okay. I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those uh, astrometeorologists that cast charts for particular moments. You see, in astrology, there are, the time slice technique has dominated to the point where most people think there's no other alternative. And by time slice technique, I mean horoscope, which literally means view of the hour. 
You know, it's a slice. It's a time slice. Mm -hmm. It's a good technique. And obviously, you know, in a, if you get if you take a time slice at a critical moment, um, you've got something you can work with. But uh, for weather, I generally work with uh, uh, planetary positions, you know, uh, relative to uh, equinoxes, and things like that. Would this work like with sidereal, since it's it's following? Well, no, it's not exactly. Fo it's. Well, it hmm. could work with sidereal, but it, you know, it, it wouldn't it be easily because we're not really concerned so much with sign positions as we are with positions along the ecliptic. The zodiac actually serves more as a tablecloth than as an integral component of the Uranian system. Now, that's not to say that the, the zodiac is rejected. It's not. It's used. It's considered. You know, and the Uranian system uses secondary progressions and transits. But, it, but it's not used to the extent that it is used in traditional astrology. Um, if, if you wanted to use absolute longitude and call every planet in a chart by its absolute longitude decree position, you could do Uranian astrology fine. You don't need to know what sign it's in. Okay. Uh, let's see, a couple of observations. One is somebody believes that some of the psychological definitions for Uranian astrology have been done by Ruth Brummond. They have. And Yes, uh, she uh, she's been one of the carriers of the tradition. Um, there has been, you know, Ebertine did some excellent uh, psychological and sociological uh, delineations of these points. So it's been done. It just hasn't. Uh, you know, I think my the important point I'm making is that the technical side of this kind of astrology is such that it draws to it people that have technical uh, a liking for technical uh, methodologies and those people tend to be less interested in the psychological so in other words it draws in more the left brain it has and less the right brain type one last question is you mentioned on how excellent it is for rectification are there planets that you specifically use in that or that you focus on well the best thing to do would be, to, you know, is to uh, put the planets in the, you know, the natal chart out on a 360 and calculate solar arcs. And I use half the solar arc and double solar arc as well, which I, I won't explain now, but it's, it's part of the, the system. And um, I have a list of events in a person's life, and I just clock them as best I can. If you get, for example, uh, you can, uh, if there's like death of the mother, you usually see that the, you know, the solar arc added to the midheaven or something comes to the moon Saturn midpoint you could figure when that's approximately going to occur and adjust it a little bit you know working backwards and find the time of birth so it sounds like it's it's good for predictive work as well as looking back because of these well I think so too. I mean just the example that I showed you with Romney and uh, Obama mm -hmm. I mean I th that's a very simple example of how you can use the system to predict the outcome of an election I thought it was it was very clear to me that Romney had too much going against him with that prominent Saturn, and, and Obama uh, had the uh, Jupiter-Mars going for him. The last question that some people are wondering, are there any good books that you would recommend, or have you written anything? Well, that's the big question. I, I wrote an article called Introduction to Uranian, uh, no, it was called Uranian Astrology for the Complete Idiot, and it was in The Mountain Astrologer, you know, about 10 years ago, or maybe not even that. But uh, you could look that up, and that's a good introduction, introductory article. I have a lot in it. But there, there are some books out there. There's Maria Sims' Dial Detective and Roger Jacobson's Principles of Uranian um, Astrology. I think that's the title. There are a few out there, but not many. I don't, I don't think the definitive textbook on Uranian astrology has been written yet. You kind of have to pull together things. There's a lot out there on the Internet on it. We'll, I'm sure we'll see more books published in the future, but there's not a lot on it. It's it's a uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in it in still in Germany and other parts of Europe and interestingly Thailand. You know it depends you know where a teacher goes and uh, ga and gathers students and so on. Um, my recommendation would be to look at book lists, uh, you know references that other writers have have um, listed in their articles on Uranian astrology and 
uh, see what you can put together, but I can't recommend a single text at this point, unfortunately.